The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the fourth chapter of the book of Malachi. Might be a touch unfamiliar where it is, but if you can find Matthew, just flip a page backwards and you're probably there. Malachi chapter 4, we're going to be reading uh, verses 1 and 2. I know it says 2a, but we're going to read just the whole thing, why not? Uh, Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. See, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will, never, it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? No, God, give us ears to hear. Ears to hear your words and not mine. Your words that call us, your words that shape us, your words that transform us. Help us to hear them, and help us in this time now to listen. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord, amen. I can distinctly remember when I realized that Jason was a human, not you Jason. Jury's out. No. No. I distinctly remember it. I was in the fifth grade, about 10 years old. And I'm going to tell you right now, as much as a 10 year old could hate somebody, I probably hated Jason that much. Jason was, in all that I knew, was a rich kid, wore nice clothes to school, nice shoes. And I was, well, let's just say not. I, I didn't have nice shoes, and, and Jason liked to point it out. He often would say, look at Chris and his bobos. And if you don't know what bobos are, you've never really suffered much in this world, I think. He'd also talk about how I, I wore the same clothes every other day, sometimes three days a week. I hated him. I probably had about 50 pounds on him, though. It didn't matter when you're 10. You don't think that way. Just someone makes you feel small. So you don't like him. The thing about it that made it worse was Jason looked exactly like Ken Griffey Jr. If you don't know who that is, either I'm too old or you don't know your baseball. But he did. He looked exactly. And I love Ken Griffey Jr. Sweetest swing, I think, ever in the history of the game. But Jason, oh, he's bad. But I remember one day, I remember one day our teacher, Miss Page, got him. I don't remember what it was. I don't remember what it was for. I don't know if, if he cussed on the playground. I don't know if he drew in his textbook. I don't know what it was, but Miss Page dressed him down in front of the class, and you know how I was feeling. Yes. Somebody got him. Whole rest of that day, I sat in my chair just, hmm, ain't it nice? Well, school was over. Bell rang, 3 o'clock. Uh, uh, College Street Elementary School is where I went. It's not a school anymore. It's, I think they're turning into a museum. But in those days, you didn't have a car rider line. The doors just opened, and you just spilled out of the building, right? And so here we, we always uh, walked home or sometimes. Sometimes Mama would pick us up a few blocks down uh, from the entrance to the school. So we would walk. I always remember going out of College Street and going to the left. And I remembered... I remember every day Jason would get in his mama's blue Plymouth van and drive off, but not today. His daddy came to pick him up. His daddy came to pick him up in his white Suburban, and I remember when that door opened, Jason, this, this little boy that I knew I just could not stand, slumped. And when that door opened, I heard shouting and screaming coming out at him and that familiar look of his shoulder shaking as he started to cry. And I remembered in that moment, not thinking, there's that boy, he gets what he deserves, that old terrible so-and-so. I remember thinking, oh, no. I hate it for Jason. Because all of a sudden I realized, he's just like me. As much as a 10-year-old boy could, I remember thinking, gosh, I hope he doesn't get in too much trouble. 
or whatever he did. Isn't that something? Now, I'm grown now. I wouldn't say I have any real enemies. It's like a 10-year-old mind. But, you know, if you read Scripture, people of God have some enemies. Malachi, it's the last book in our Old Testament, but it's not the last chronologically. Malachi comes somewhere after uh, the Persians let the Jews go back to Jerusalem, but before the campaigns of Ezra and Nehemiah to rebuild the temple. So you can imagine the, the people coming out of Babylon, going back home. They've got some enemies. They've got some bullies in mind. The Babylonians. I mean, they're a generation or so removed from exile, but you can imagine, right, growing up in exile, listening to mom and dad, grandmama and granddaddy talk about, oh, it was so bad those Babylonians came in with their claws and their sharpened teeth. Boy, I hated those people. They came in and you'd imagine growing up there now, what are they? They're demons or devils, enemies. And so as you come back home, that's enemy number one. But you know who else is there? The people who left, were left behind. When the Babylonians exiled uh, Jerusalem, they didn't take all of them. They took just the best and the brightest and left behind everybody from the middle down. And so you can imagine when they get back, look at y'all, look at y'all, y'all sat here, we were in exile, y'all over here just living it up, got to stay at home, didn't have to change your address at the post office, you got to stay right here at home, and we had to suffer for a generation. That's enemy number two, right? Think about it, coming back into this place. And so Malachi, or really we don't know the prophet's name, Malachi just means my messenger. The prophet is anonymous in this story, in this book. And so when he proclaims to the people of Israel, the first three chapters are all about priestly, Levitical, law, and order. Malachi, what's the one passage everybody knows from Malachi? Bring your tithes into the store. Some of y'all probably got a little sweaty when you said, Malachi, oh my God. No. It turns in a moment into the prophetic tradition that started way back with my favorite in Amos in the 8th century, what was called the Day of Yahweh. And by the time Malachi is proclaiming to the people, Amos proclaimed the day of Yahweh as this day of judgment for God's people, for them not listening, for the way they treated the poor and the needy in their land. The day of Yahweh was a day of judgment. But by the time of Malachi, the day of Yahweh, the day of the Lord, has become this thing to look forward to. It was liberation and punishment for the wicked, for their enemies, for their bullies. And so you can imagine when the prophet says, see, the day is coming. They're all like, yeah, teacher's about to get on to them now. You can see them. Yeah, the day of Yahweh is coming. And those Babylonians are really going to get it. They're not just going to, the Persians aren't going to just let us go. The Babylonians are going to get their due. And all those who sat back here, they're going to have to give us what's ours. Burning like an oven. It's going to be good. Oh, man, they're going to get burned up. But then he says, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. Now, I know y'all don't think like this. But if I had been in that group coming back, eventually, you know what happens when I found all the folks who are different than me that I don't like that are wrong? You know what happens? You know what I start doing? Well, the people who are like me, I start finding fault with them, too. Yeah, we all suffered over in Babylon. We all suffered over there under oppression. But you know, while I was over there, old Jim Bob, he was a little full of himself. Old Joe Jack, yeah, he got a little full of himself over there. You know what, Lord, while you're at it, go on and take out the ones who, you know, while we were over there, they, they got a little high on the horse, right? High on the hog. All the arrogant that's not just the Babylonians. That's not just the ones. That's all the ones who were well, arrogant. And who thinks they're arrogant? Nobody thinks they're arrogant except people who are looking at someone else. Evildoers, that's a nice little, little thing to just throw them all in. Get all the evildoers, burn the stubble. That day shall come and burn them up, says Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. Nothing will be left. Now, that's the, way, that's the way you talk about it, right? 
The day of the Lord, when it comes, everybody who gets their comeuppance gets it. Everybody gets burned up in the oven. Everybody, wicked, arrogant, evildoers, all the ones, the bullies, the teacher calls them out and dresses them down in front of class. That's what happens on the day of Yahweh. But in verse 2, for the rest of us, for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. Man, that's, there, if there is ever a biblical phrase that sounds wonderful, it's that, isn't it? The Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. I love that. Now, don't get it mistaken. I know this is right next to Matthew. And in English, it's really nice to change that U to an O to make it sound like it's talking about Jesus, but that doesn't work in Hebrew the sun of righteousness, the day of righteousness will dawn with healing in its wings. When you will be fully restored and healed and made whole. Think about it in your own life. When there have been people who've done you wrong, people who've hurt you, even when they get what you think they deserve, do you feel better about it? Do you feel made whole when that happens? Or do you just move on? Move on to the next thing. No. It takes something else for healing to happen. The prophet says, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. It won't be enough for them to be burned up in the oven. You need the warmth of the sun of righteousness to heal. But here's the, the linchpin for this and why I included it here. That last sentence, some of us in here know a thing or two about this, right? You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. That sounds like a throwaway metaphor, doesn't it? Just, you just read it, you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. Okay, yeah, we'll go out in a, a leaping. We won't go out dancing because we're still going to hold on to being Baptist, right? Uh, we're not going to go out leaping. We're going to go out leaping like calves from the stall. But let me tell you what came to my mind when I read that. Right after high school, uh, my, my friend John, who you all have, have heard a thing or two about, uh, John and I started thinking we were cowboys. Uh, we'd wear hats, uh, even to Walmart. I mean, we were crazy. Uh, boots. And we, we had some horses. Uh, and then one day in New Brockton, Alabama, the Mustang sale was coming. And we bought a cattle trailer, or not, we borrowed a cattle trailer and threw a tarp over the top of it. Uh, we, we were stupid. Um, and John and I walked away with three horses and, and didn't even spend $200. A lot of people, in fact, bought a lot of horses. Laverl, who lived, uh, that's only a South Alabama name, Laverl, lived across the road from my friend John. And Laverl called us one day, said, John, won't that big friend of yours, and I love that, big friend of yours come over here and help me put a saddle on this Mustang. So we walked over and Laverl had this Mustang, this horse, pinned against his barn between two cattle panels. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Two pieces of fence. And over the top, we put the saddle down, and we cinched it up, and then Laverl said what I was afraid he was going to say. He looked at me and said, why don't you get up on him? <laughs> now, here's the thing. Laverl named this horse Driveway. And we said, Laverro, why'd you name him Driveway? Well, every time he gets out, he just stands in the driveway. And so we put the saddle on Driveway, cinched it up. Now, let me ask you, just think with me creatively for a moment. If you are a wild horse, and they're pinned between two panels, and three men are standing around you, and the biggest one looks like he's about to get on your back, what's going through your mind at the moment? As soon as Laverle let the pressure off of that panel, the cinch broke, and driveway took off, and I went that way. And I swear to you, friends, as that horse ran, he looked back and winked at me. <laughs> he ran all the way to the other end of that pasture. Why does a horse do that? He's, he's not dumb. He knows we're going to get him. We're going to put him back in. We're going to put a new saddle with a new cinch. going to put it back on him. Why? Because for that brief moment, he could remember he was free. Why does a calf leap, leap from the stall? Keep in mind, this is ancient Judea. They're not giving him a shot. 
They're not deworming the calf. What are they about to do to a calf in the stall? They're going to slaughter it. They're going to slaughter it. Maybe for sacrifice. Maybe for, I don't know, ancient Near Eastern veal parmesan. I don't know. They're going to slaughter it. But when that calf feels the pressure come off, when the gate opens and it runs free, it knows, I was destined to die, but now I'm alive. I think what the prophet means, it can be real easy to just wring our hands when our enemies get what's coming to them. It can be real easy for a 10-year-old boy to see his bully dressed down in front of the class and to think, oh yeah, all is right, I've got justice. But at the end of the day, that bully goes home and is somebody's son. We can wring our hands and say, oh, my bully's going to get it. Oh, those enemies, those people who do me wrong, they're going to get it. But at the end of the day, they are still a child of God. And I think in some subtle way, this prophet, with all these folks wringing their hands about the Babylonians, the Persians, those folks who got away, who got to stay back home and keep everything the way they wanted, everybody, the arrogant, the evildoers, the idol worshipers, all the ones who didn't do what they wanted them to do and what they thought was right, The prophet says at the end of the day, we're all just calves leaping from the stall. We were all destined to die. We were all destined for something far worse. And at the end of the day, the sun of righteousness rises and we are sprung from the stall. And we leap like those who know, hey, hey, I know there are a lot of people against me, but God is with me. That at the end of the day, yeah, you can look back and try to run over the one who put you in the stall, but what matters is that you're free, that you've been redeemed, that God, that God has liberated you from whatever it is. And friends, we can hold on, we can hold on to the hurt, we can hold on to the pain, we can hold on to the stall, we can hold on to whatever injury, whatever, whatever hurt somebody has caused us. But remember, at the end of the day, God's still with us. And those who hurt us, they are still, in the eyes of God, just children. They're just children. So what do we hold on to? The pain? The brokenness? The sin? Or do we hold on to our redemption? Our liberation? Our freedom? that each and every one of us has in the love of Christ. What are you holding on to? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, Lord, help us to hold on to our redemption To recognize, Lord, that while others may hurt us, while things in this world may seek to to trap us, to bring us down, at the end of the day, Lord, we are like calves freed from the stall, freed by your love, by your grace, by your son, Jesus. So, Lord, help us now. Now, as we go into a season we think of all that we're thankful for. May we be most mindful, God, of your great and endless love for us and seek each day not to focus on that which would keep us down, that which would keep us apart, that which would hurt us, but to try, Lord, through your will and your strength to focus more each day on the love and redemption and freedom that you give to us. Be with us now, Holy Spirit. Be with us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.